Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. This is the 12th of July. A um, few updates this week. Um, on a personal level, I've realized I am now officially old. Uh, you might have thought that I would have realized that from the complete lack of any hair. Uh, but I've got my eyes tested, I now need readers. So I can really embrace kind of that old man feel. Still feels really weird. Um, so this week, actually, I wanted to start off with a thank you. So this week I did hit 25,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel. So I really do appreciate that. Um, we really run this channel to help people and share information. So please just carry on liking, commenting, sharing, uh, and subscribing. So a big thank you from uh, me to all of you. Quick note for kind of a, a special focus for this week is the Azure Desktop application. Now what this really does is it provides the Azure portal in a desktop application. It's using Electron. And if you maybe have limited browser options, maybe I only have the old kind of Internet Explorer, what this does is it gives me kind of that full modern Azure experience in a desktop application. Then it also gives me support for multiple contexts. So from PowerShell, for example, I can have contexts. I might use different accounts. So with this dash dash user data space, the context name, I can easily switch between different contexts I actually want to run with. For example, uh, if I just quickly open up VS Code. So here I've got kind of a command and it's dash dash user data john at sabletech.net. So if I was just to kind of now run as that context, it will launch that desktop application as that context, and I'm automatically signed in as john at sabletech.net. So all good to go. If I was to kind of switch over and give that command back, I've got a different context, use a new one. Well, what it's going to do now, if I can actually get it to select, it doesn't know what that context is. So this will actually then go through the regular kind of, hey, sign an experience. But once I did that, it would remember it. So if I would just go and type in a new credential, it would then carry on. And I mistyped that, but that's the problem of trying to type while someone's viewing. And the reason I'm using john at sabletech.net again is I kind of actually want to show something in the next thing we're going to talk about in a second. But that's kind of the big deal. So we have this desktop application available to us and you can just go and download that. So it's portal.azure.com slash app slash download and now get this nice desktop application. So on to kind of new features. So the Azure Load Balancer now supports IP addresses in addition to network interface cards. And now this is in preview. Uh, under preview, it's only 100 IP supported, and it's only the standard load balancer. And you might be trying to work out, well, what exactly does that mean? So if you think about ordinarily, if I have the load balancer, so kind of I have the load balancer, and what that load balancer has is kind of a front-end configuration, and then we kind of have a back-end pool. And historically, that pool was always essentially the NIC. Now that NIC was associated with a VM, it could also have been VMs that are part of a VM scale set. But I couldn't just specify an IP and kind of what um, network it was on. I couldn't do that, well now I can. So it's gonna open up some new possibilities in the future of well now the Azure Load Balancer could balance to things that aren't virtual machines, that aren't in a virtual machine scale set. Now the documentation gives examples of pods in AKS. It's actually a poor example. I would not do this with pods in AKS. Pods in AKS has its own functionality around the service and the load balancer points to the workers. And maybe containers without AKS, but not pods. But definitely it's going to open up new things we can do. So as a load balancer, I can now have IP addresses as part of that kind of backend pool. Azure Virtual WAN has made a number of features generally available. So if we remember what is Azure Virtual WAN, if we think about 
Historically, I may have had several locations. And what I would have done in the past is something like maybe an MPLS to connect them together. But then we have Azure with this great big network. And of course, we connect to regions um, to this great big network. But there's lots, lots of kind of pop and edge sites all around the world. So what Azure Virtual WAN lets me do is essentially create this virtual WAN. And you kind of talk about this as SD WAN, the software defined WAN. And so now I have my locations. I just use the Internet. And what we have is in each region, we would have a hub. That's a virtual network that's just used for virtual WAN. And if I had two regions, I would have a hub in each. And they were part of this virtual WAN. And then what I could have is I could have um, site to site VPN connections into there. I could have express route connections into there. I could have users on machines doing point to site connections. I might have other VNets that kind of peer into these hubs. It enables transitive communication between the VNets. It enables any to any communication because my locations can now talk to each other. And there were like appliances, virtual WAN solutions I can purchase. So I'm not worrying about the configuration. I drop this appliance on, connects to the internet, and I'm done. I'm now using that huge network capability of Azure to provide not only connections between my offices, but also connections to everything in Azure. Um, so what they really announced was hub to hub connectivity. So now if I have these multiple hubs, well, it's going to route traffic over that Azure backbone between them. So now things connected to different hubs, well, they can talk to each other. Also, now I can transit route between express route and site to site VPNs. So my main headquarters might be connected via express route, but it can still go and talk to things connected via site to site. I do need global reach on the express route always. Um, if I had multiple express routes, it won't actually go via these hubs. It would just use the global reach, which is kind of that um, routing between different express route circuits, most fast and efficient path that is there. Other features. So now 50 gigabit per second transit between virtual WANs, connected VNets. So I've got huge amounts of connectivity available. I can have custom routing. So I can set up my own route tables, my own priorities for the traffic going over my virtual WAN. Uh, we can now use BGP IP uh, site configuration. So this is like the 169.254, I think it's .21.22. I can use normally that range that's used if it can't find a DHCP server. I can now use that as part of my VPN configuration. And there were some new kind of virtual WAN appliances actually announced. So a whole bunch of capabilities around Azure Virtual WAN were actually released. So if I do have kind of different main locations and branch offices, I want to get them to connect to each other. And I really want to simplify that process. And um, really that's what Azure Virtual WAN is all about. And I've had a lot of requests for a deep dive. And um, so I will release an Azure Virtual WAN video in the next couple of weeks um, when I get some time. Azure Storage, really just one big change. Uh, the single blob maximum increased from roughly five terabytes to roughly 200 terabytes. That's in preview. It's not exactly five and it's not exactly 200. It's a multiple, but it is around those numbers. A few miscellaneous changes. Um, Azure AD branding. So you may have noticed I was trying to kind of show this. But when I showed this page, trying to sign in with my credential and I use my John at SavileTech.net. Notice that kind of warning text. So I've now got bold text. I've got underline. I've got a hyperlink. I can do italic. So we can actually now use kind of a markup as part of our configuration. And if I actually jump over to my main kind of one I've already signed in with, if I go and look at my company branding, look at my default. What we can see is the sign in page text and notice I'm using kind of that markup language there. 
so I can now have a little bit more information. I can have hyperlinks actually as part of that sign-in page text. So it gives me kind of some new capabilities around that. And obviously you can see me kind of using this nice Azure desktop application. Azure Security Center, um, we have this secure score that kind of gives me this overall score based on lots of different factors. I can now access that score via an API. The advanced data security capabilities have actually been extended for SQL outside of Azure. So if I had SQL running in a different cloud, if I had SQL running on premises, well, I can now enable that advanced data security for SQL Server capability. And there is a charge for that. It's something I have to go and install a log analytics agent on those instances for. And then in Security Center, kind of the pricing page, there's an optional little flag to set that says, hey, enable this capability. The log analytics agent deploy recommendation um, will now be shown for Windows and Linux Arc machines. Who's going to say, hey, you need to go and install the agent. It's going to recommend I do that. There are a whole bunch of new policies, ones around kind of continuous export and workflow automations for security alerts and recommendations. And um, there were policies, if I had network security groups missing, it would kind of flag that for internet facing machines, but it would always flag it even if it was non-internet facing. So I'd get kind of confused. Now we separate those alerts into ones that really are internet facing and ones that are non-internet facing. Non-internet facing would probably be less of a risk. Um, there's a whole new set of threat protections I can enable for things like AKS and SQL and storage and app service plans and a whole bunch of those. They all now roll into this um, new set of policies. So it will detect when they're not there and be brought in as part of that Azure Security Center recommendations. Um, Azure Kubernetes service now supports Azure policy. And this is preview. It's only for Linux node pools because it's using some of the capabilities of Linux to actually do the enforcement, kind of sit in between, hey, my, my deployment and then the actual um, API service to make these things happen. And what I can do is I can run this in an audit mode, so just tell me, or an actual deny or enforce mode. There's a whole set of these policies around, hey, maybe I want to deploy GetOps. So I'm going to point it at a GitHub repository as they automatically go and make those files that are kind of published a reality of my Kubernetes cluster. I might say, hey, I, I want to eliminate any kind of privileged container. I might want to only use HTTPS. So there's a whole set of these policies that I can actually leverage. If we go and look at the Kubernetes policies, we can see things like, hey, enforce HTTPS ingress to Kubernetes clusters, uh, enforce internal load balancers, enforce labels. There's a whole set now, so I can create these policies, I can target my AKS instances, and it will either audit to tell me if I'm not doing this, or actually enforce it, deny things. And I'm saying AKS, so obviously this can be AKS in Azure. It can also be kind of AKS on Arc, so I've got my Arc enabled Kubernetes environments, I can use Azure policy there. Um, if I'm also running on the AKS engines, so I've got Azure Stack Hub, I can use Azure policy there as well. So these kind of new capabilities, um, all around enabling policy to ensure I'm running in a kind of consistent um, and meeting any requirements I may have. So that's it for this week. Um, I hope that was useful. Um, if it was, please like, comment, share, subscribe, and uh, until next week, stay safe.